This is a video about a show called Slug Riot, and why it matters, along with the entire independent animation scene. You've probably never heard of it, but that's okay. It's conveniently located right here on YouTube, where you can enjoy all 17 and a half glorious minutes of it after I'm done convincing you of its quiet and humble importance. If that seems short, it's because it is. Five four-ish minute long episodes, and that's all there is to it. But that's all you need to tell a story, if you know what you're doing. And that's part of what I'm here to talk about. But don't worry too much, this won't take very long either, because the point is very simple. Indie animation is punk rock, and you should love it. <laughs> Slug Riot is a miniseries about a 12-year-old girl named Georgia in a nowhere town who wants nothing more than to be an indie rock legend like her older brother, Slug Riot, and tries to pester him out of retirement when he returns to his hometown to, I guess, give up and die because he's jaded and tired. It comes from Cartoon Hangover, the vehicle through which Frederator distributes independently produced animation. If you recognize that name, it's probably because of Bee and Puppycat, which now belongs to Netflix, I guess, but we'll still talk about it, probably. Slug Riot was produced by tiny Bristol-based studio Wildseed, who hold open submissions at least once a year to offer development grants to talented writers and artists. A grant I like to assume for personal reasons was offered at one point to series creator Mike Rosenthal, no, not, not this guy, a different one, who is now lead writer at Respawn Entertainment, which makes Apex Legends, which I do not play, but I am told has some pretty fun writing. Why am I burdening you with all this disconnected information? Because the pond in which we dare to swim is very small, and full of not just big fish, but prehistoric megalodons. And it's angelic and ethereal little jellyfish like this that keep the ecosystem alive. Now, allow me to derail my train of thought even further as I express to you how this show affected me personally. There are a lot of very promising hills to die on in entertainment, and contrary to popular belief, animation as a respectable medium is among the very bloodiest. The first thing you learn when you start trying to work in Western animation is that you are nowhere near the first to think it has the potential to be more than it is now, and you will certainly not be the last tossed unceremoniously into the mass grave of starry-eyed anime fans and edgy art school kids that waits hungrily just over the crest. Isaac Stern once said that it is only through failure and experimentation that we learn and grow. But he was a violinist, and animation is significantly more expensive. So as I have learned to, you must forgive the unstoppable machine of Gravity Falls and Family Guy clones ranging from fun spins to abhorrent ripoffs that dominate the Western animation landscape today, and simply appreciate the little things. Quite literally. Because on a very fundamental level, they represent what it is we all really aspire to. There's a lot to notice from the start about even a micro-scale project like this, from the refreshing, if a little simplistic, art style to the classic 2000s-style voice acting. I'm in the deep end of the pool. Let her out, Shannon! She doesn't have her floaty! The killer soundtrack of whatever the hell Moldcore is. But even if you're not really trained to notice these stylistic choices or what they do on a larger scale, you will undoubtedly feel the love poured into it all. There's an exuberance that just oozes out of the screen, like that stuff from Slug Riot's ear. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but that's part of the charm. That charm is the inexplicable influence of raw creative energy on display. You can tell when a cast of actors is having fun together in a scene. You can feel when a performer's charisma shockwaves its way through the crowd. And in a similar way, you can sense the sheer joy of creation in a show like Slug Riot. Now I cannot speak for Mike Rosenthal as a creative spirit, but I can speak for the physical imprint of an artist on something they seriously care about making. The most obvious of which is synergy, or to use a more artsy word for the sake of effect, harmony. 
There's a difference between a show in which every aesthetic aspect is separately well executed, like, say, Dave Filoni's Star Wars shows, which are meant to fit into a pre-branded universe, and a show in which those choices all complement each other to serve a singular voice, and at that one very personal and therefore intimate. It's not by nature a difference in quality, but reads like a kind of authenticity and gives the viewer a more inherently engaging experience. Which leads me, directly, to the second and much more intangible artistic fingerprint on a personal project, that being voice. Or, to be obnoxiously technical, let's call it productive idiosyncrasy. Because it's so hard to explain, even with education and experience, I'll take some of the academic load off of myself by returning to Bee and Puppycat. It's a good show to look at because of Natasha Allegri's connection to Adventure Time, which she was hired onto by close friend and creator Penn Ward, and spent years working on before finally getting her chance to do her own thing. The DNA of Adventure Time is there in Bee and Puppycat, with the saltwater taffy color scheme and the bubbly character designs, but what people really responded to was its aggressively unusual voice, developing natural comedy through the awkward flow of dialogue and fearless use of surrealism on a more conceptual level as opposed to stylistic, both of which are coincidentally very rare in Western animation. Audiences are always going to be hungry for something fresh and new, obviously, we get bored easily, but it's projects that manage to be unique and still maintain full control of their narrative that stick with their core demographics and expand, allowing the ripple effect to loosen the vice grip of foolproof formulas on the industry at large. And that's something everyone should be desperate for by now. Now, I made a joke earlier about how animation is more expensive than playing the violin, which you'll have to forgive me if it wasn't very funny, but I also now realize it wasn't very wise, because it might have underserved the point of just how expensive animation really is. Western animation fans, especially more casual ones, often have this simplistic perspective issue where they watch some really great anime like Mob Psycho 100, where the writing is mature without being needlessly grim, it's fun without forgetting to have a story, and much more importantly, the animation is spectacular, and they go, well, why can't we just do that here? The answer is, more often than not, an overwhelming list of reasons. Most genuinely good anime, especially in the modern era, are adaptations of manga, produced by shockingly massive teams of artists being paid notably less than even the federal US minimum wage for aggressively illegal hours, and even then they sometimes still only manage one season every, like, three and a half years. The raw financial risk assumed by producing original animation is less of a factor in the Western stigma surrounding it and more of a drill sergeant staring a hole through the back of its head while it very slowly and discreetly tries to make a pretty sculpture out of its rifle. When that risk pays off, however, you have the story of Gendy Tartakovsky, who serves as living proof that artistic integrity and practical marketing can coexist when folded into a functional system and given the tools necessary to thrive. Now, while Gendy rose through the ranks of Warner Media as an artist, very much not the indie scene in principle, the initial development of the Cartoon Network in the 90s was, in itself, a risk taken by a major media corporation in using animation as a primary selling point, and Dexter's Lab was an instrumental piece of its launch. Moving forward, Tartakovsky remained on the forefront of the animation industry, never faltering in his artistic voice, even when charged with otherwise impermeable IPs, like, well, Star Wars, actually. The culmination of his personal mark on the animation landscape is the trust Warner put in him to produce Primal, a magnum opus of minimalist storytelling unmatched by almost any animated work, western or otherwise. Seriously, please watch 
primal. It's so impossibly great. Just give this man his due. But Gendy Tartakovsky isn't just an inspiration to the next generation of creators. He's also a roadmap. Cartoon Network's earliest projects radiated the intense and almost edgy indie energy of the era it was born in, but the new age has proven to belong almost exclusively to the internet. As difficult as animation continues to be to make, distributing it is nowhere near the task it was before the proliferation of consumable media on the internet, leading to experimental projects like Has Been Hotel, A Start, and of course Slug Riot getting their time in the sun for really anyone willing to trust the blossoming online landscape. I realize I could be oversimplifying things by singing the praises of indie energy as if all animation should be plucky and weird when shows like BoJack Horseman have proven already that big companies taking a similar risk in the modern era can produce irreplicable masterpieces that don't fit that bill. But what I'm trying to express here is that the relationship is symbiotic. You really can't have one without the other. Raphael Bob Waksberg didn't leverage an illustrious career of success through idiosyncrasy like Tartakovsky did. He took advantage of Netflix's desire to make its mark in the early landscape of streaming animation and rocketed something practically unheard of to the forefront. That opportunity just doesn't exist in a complacent marketplace. The need for variation wells up from the very bottom. The grassroots are always, always where curiosity becomes interest, and interest becomes demand, and then demand becomes need, and the tectonic shift that we used to dream about finally comes to pass. There is no Bojack Horseman without the work of Don Hertzfeldt. There's no Laika without Ardman, and no Cartoon Saloon without both of them. Without the pioneers of early Adult Swim just repurposing old Hanna-Barbera footage, the landscape of adult animation would be half of what it is now. No Boondocks, no Venture Brothers, no Primal, and once again, no Bojack Horseman. And it's important to be an active part of giving these projects the attention and praise they deserve. Because despite what even the most cynical of us will tell you, it's ultimately what you and I and everyone else actually sit through and talk about on the internet that determines what we're fed next. So please, just watch them and I promise you will love them. Like you love Adventure Time, you will love being Puppycat. Like you love Bojack, you will love Anomalisa and I Lost My Body. You can feel the blood, sweat, and tears that went into a start and into Primal, and it's so worth it because they're awesome. They're meaningful. They're risking life and limb just to show you something you didn't even know you needed. Indie animation is punk rock, and so is fucking Slug Rider.